Now you've completed your field carrier landing practice, and you're ready to apply what you've learned ashore to landing on the deck of a carrier. In transposing your skills from the field to the ship, you'll find there are certain differences to take into consideration. You'll have more wind in the groove, but virtually no crosswind. You'll be adjusting to new signals and to conditions where your landing area may pitch and roll. Tire pressures are higher in order to absorb the greater impact of arrested landing. Taxiing requires more power and more braking. Many of these variations will be presented in this film. As you approach the carrier to enter the brake, parallel the base recovery course, or Fox Corpin, close aboard the starboard side at 800 feet. Your hook should be up for touch and goes, down for an arrested landing. If your interval is past the 90 degree position, brake just forward of the bow. When taking interval on other aircraft already established in the pattern, break when the A7 or A4 ahead of you is at your 7.30 position. For any other aircraft, including props, your 7 o'clock position. When breaking out of formation, take a 17-second interval on the aircraft ahead. Entering the break, 250 knots indicated airspeed is optimum if single, 300 knots for a section or more. After braking, slow to 220 knots, dirty up and descend to the pattern altitude of 500 feet when wings level downwind. On the downwind leg, complete the landing checklist. Cross check angle of attack at 17 and a half units for proper airspeed. Once you have determined your angle of attack is correct, Engage and check your APC if you're using it in your approach. Look for the proper abeam position, one and a quarter miles. Don't rely on the aircraft ahead of you. He could possibly be out of position. The best guide is to use TACAN DME until you have calibrated your eye as to the relative size of the ship at the proper distance abeam. Under optimum wind conditions of 30 knots, you will start your turn off the 180, abeam the LSO platform. For winds in excess of 35 knots, start the turn abeam the island. For lighter wind conditions, or APC approaches, turn later on an extension of the ramp position. Make a level instrument turn off the 180 through the 90 degree position using 25 to 27 degrees of bank. Start looking for the meat ball between the 90 and the 45. Do not start your descent without a ball. Wings level in the groove with proper lineup will put you slightly starboard of the wake. Call the ball when you see it, or Clara if you don't have it by the time you level your wings at the start. Pack saddle 524, Corsair, manual ball, state 42, Davis. If you're using APC, report auto ball. Once you've acquired the meat ball, you're somewhere within three quarters of a degree of optimum glide slope. From that point on, keep your eye on the ball all the way. Keep it in the center and make any necessary corrections as far out as possible. Maintain optimum angle of attack all the way to touchdown. Keep lined up with the angled deck Crab slightly starboard to compensate for the movement of the ship, which is on a course 10 degrees right of your track in the groove. On an airfield, the angle of the glide slope is approximately 3 degrees. But this, in conjunction with the increased wind at the ship, is not enough slope for hook-to-ramp clearance in carrier landings. So the angle is increased to 3.5 degrees or 4 degrees for ships of lesser ramp to wire distances or when unusually high wind conditions occur. The resultant effect of natural and ship-made wind is a 30-knot headwind in the groove. Your aircraft is actually closing the ship at approximately 100 knots. Therefore, your rate of descent is less. This essentially shallows your glide slope 
and you'll find you're using more power at the ship. So keep your eye on the ball all the way to touchdown. Don't spot the deck, or you're asking for trouble. Now let's get out of animation and back to the real world. Arriving at the carrier, you follow the pattern we've just discussed. Make a level break just forward of the bow. Dirty the plane at 220 knots and descend to pattern altitude of 500 feet when wings level downwind. Start your final turn a mile and a quarter abeam the LSO platform. Pick up the ball and keep it centered as you follow the glide slope all the way to the deck. On touchdown, advance the throttle to full power. As forward motion ceases, reduce power to idle and allow the aircraft to roll back. Raise the hook at the completion of the rollback. Add power in anticipation of taxiing clear of the landing area, holding your brakes until given the come ahead. Hold the wings on the director's signal. When the come ahead signal is received, release brakes and taxi clear of the landing area. Use brakes for directional control until nose wheel steering is available. Taxi the aircraft as directed, but do not use excessive power. Usually, a maximum of 70% will be enough to counteract the effects of jet blast or high wind as you taxi to the catapult. Follow the director's signals at all times. If you're waiting behind the blast deflector for launch, hold the nose steering button engaged. Brakes on. This will prevent the aircraft from swinging around or sliding due to wind or jet blast. Check the weight board to verify the gross weight. Your takeoff checklist should be complete before taxiing on to the catapult. UHT is trimmed four degrees nose up. Approach the cat track slowly. Ride the brakes lightly and evenly. Nose gear steering should be engaged. Follow the plane director's signals closely to align the aircraft with the cat. As the aircraft moves forward, the holdback assembly is installed. When the plane is properly aligned, the director will signal the pilot to drop the launch bar. Then, as the holdback assembly stops the aircraft, the launch bar drops into the shuttle. Disengage the nose steering on the director's signal. Do not use it after the launch bar is positioned in the track. When you're lined up with the cat, align the compass with the base recovery course. At light fuel weights, a one-finger turn-up may be required to depress the nose strut and allow the launch bar to drop into the shuttle. When you receive the signal to take tension, go to full power. Release the brakes. The launch bar switch should be off. Check EPR and other engine instruments. On the A7A, engage the bleed switch. The EPR drop should be about 0.17. Make sure the launch bar light is out. Then make final visual checks, cat grip and friction lock, yaw stab on, control aug off. When you're ready to launch, position your head against the headrest and salute. No rotation is necessary at the end of the cat stroke, but ensure that you have the proper attitude of 10 degrees nose up, at least the minimum end speed for your gross weight and not more than 18 units of angle of attack. When you're comfortably airborne, drop your hook. While climbing to pattern altitude of 500 feet, check for interval. 8 o'clock on another A7 or A4, 7 o'clock on all other aircraft. Again, if your interval is past the 90, a turn crosswind is permissible once you're airborne, but keep climbing to 500 feet. Naturally, 
an unsatisfactory approach, rates a wave off. If the wave off lights flash or paddles tells you to wave off, it is mandatory that you take the wave off. Remember that the ship has a resting gear, so it's important that you level your wings and maintain your lineup as you advance power. It's also imperative that you do not over-rotate the aircraft, as this could result in an in-flight engagement. Maintain the optimum angle of attack. If you bolter, full power on touchdown gives you the necessary thrust to rotate to optimum angle of attack at the end of the deck. On both wave off and bolter, once you're past the bow of the ship, turn right to parallel the Fox Corpin. But be careful not to cross the bow. At other times, you'll be involved in hot switching. Always wear your hard hat. Use tinted or clear visor as appropriate. Wear gloves on the flight deck during operations. The switch pilot should always check tires, brake pins, and the aircraft for any obvious leaks. While doing this, avoid the intake and tailpipe areas. If you're the pilot being relieved, do not unstrap until the aircraft is chocked and tied down with three chains. When the aircraft is tied down and the switch pilot is at the aircraft, pull down the head knocker, install the canopy strap, Unplug the oxygen mask hose, hand the kneeboard to the plane captain, unstrap, and dismount. On the way out, make sure you don't hit the throttle or pop the bailout bottle with your feet or flight gear. The same caution applies to the switch pilot as he mounts and moves into the cockpit. Pull the brakes and strap in. No post-start checks are required, but the takeoff checklist should be completed, except for wings and compass alignment. After returning from a mission, keep the engine running until chocks, down locks, and at least three tie downs are installed. Execute a normal shutdown when the cut signal is received. Control the canopy opening rate by holding rails with both hands and install the canopy strap immediately. Always raise flaps prior to a shutdown even underway on the hangar deck. When you're on the hangar deck, remove your hard hat immediately after shutdown in order to hear whistle signals from the director. Once you've stopped, hold the brakes until the plane is tied down. Remember, you have a maximum of five brake applications after shutdown. So keep your hand on the emergency brake handle. When preparing for launch aboard ship, there are certain procedures essential to your safety. You should know the bingo or divert field, ship's weather, ship's PIM, aircraft assignment, spot, and gross weight. On deck, conduct a normal pre-flight. Inspect tires for cuts and bruises, struts for proper inflation, hook point for grease, and look for possible cable damage to the underside of the aircraft. If the aircraft is spotted with the tail over the catwalk, it may not always be possible to make a complete inspection of the aft fuselage. Mark the gross weight of the aircraft on each nose gear door. Post-start checks are the same as on the beach, except the launch bar is checked and you may not be able to drop the tail hook if the tail is over the catwalk. When the takeoff checklist is complete, report up with your gross weight to the tower. Tax settle 524 up, gross weight 22.5. 524, Roger. When up transmission is acknowledged, give the yellow shirt a thumbs up, indicating you're ready to taxi.
The head knocker should be up any time the aircraft is not tied down. Flaps should be down for nose wheel steering. Don't spread your wings until you get a signal from the director. Procedures for daytime operations also apply to night operations, but the pace is slightly reduced to compensate for reduced visibility. Instead of hand signals to the pilot, the deck crew uses lighted wands. On night operations, use a red flashlight to conduct exterior pre-flight. If more light is required, borrow a signal wand or a white lensed flashlight. Make sure the exterior light switches are properly positioned for launch. Bright and steady, approach and carrier, collision light off. The master exterior light switch should be off, and the taxi light switch should be off prior to start. The instrument light rheostat should be out of the off position to reduce the brilliance of the warning and advisory lights when the generator comes on the line. For post-start, Adjust the cockpit lights as desired and perform the system functional checks. At night, the aircraft should be handled slowly and carefully by both directors and pilots. If there's any doubt about the safety of the operation or the plane director's signal, stop the aircraft. At night, it is difficult to determine speed or motion over the deck, so always follow the director's signals closely. Directors should remain stationary so pilots can use them as guides for taxi speed. The plane director will position himself forward of the aircraft and remain stationary as you approach the catapult. Use him as a visual reference. As you approach the cat, check the weight board. A horizontal wave with a flashlight means lower the weight. If the weight figure should be increased, the signal would be up and down. When it's okay, the signal is a series of circles. Now you perform all cockpit checks prescribed for launch. When you're satisfied the aircraft is ready for launch, establish an instrument scan, gyro, airspeed, rate of climb, angle of attack. Then turn the master exterior light switch on. Be prepared to establish a wings level climbing attitude on instruments. An initial 10 degrees nose up attitude is recommended. Check for minimum end speed, proper angle of attack, a positive rate of climb, and the altimeter climbing. If a no-go situation arises, leave the exterior lights as they are and transmit to pry fly. Suspend cat two. Always maintain full power and scan until the catapult officer walks in front of the wing and gives the signal to reduce power. Then turn off lights and reduce power for pushback. Night and instrument recoveries will normally be made utilizing TACAN and CCA procedures in accordance with the CVA-CVS NATOPS manual. Remember, there is more conversation on the recovery frequency at night, so keep your transmissions to a minimum. Acknowledge with side number only. After arrestment, immediately turn the master external light switch off. Taxi out of the landing area slowly. Do not stare at the plane director's wands, but keep them in sight at all times. Use him as a speed and direction reference. Occasionally, during carrier operations, certain difficulties may arise for which you should be prepared. If you get hung up in the gear, reduce power, drop the hook when directed, release brakes, and allow the aircraft to be pulled back. Raise the hook again on signal. Often on rollback after landing, the nose wheel may swivel 180 degrees. Use your brakes for initial directional control 
and engage nose wheel steering after forward motion is established. Some pilots like to prevent this situation by engaging nose wheel steering on rollout and holding it during rollback. If you lose your radio on an approach, make normal transmissions in the blind. To indicate radio failure at night, switch lights to bright and flash. The LSO will utilize the green cut lights, first as an acknowledgement to you that he has control, later as a call for power. If you should lose one or both brakes while taxiing, inform the tower and lower tail hook immediately to indicate brake loss to the plane director. Don't discount the use of nose wheel steering to deck loop. Attempt to stop the aircraft with the emergency brakes. At night, also turn the external master light switch back on. Anytime you're on the cat and conditions develop so that you do not want to go, shake your head from side to side and transmit suspend on UHF. Never raise your hand for any reason when you're on the cat except to salute. But always be prepared to go until given the throttle back signal by the catapult officer in front of the wing. Making a successful landing on a carrier may seem to be more difficult than coming into land on a runway ashore. The landing area is in motion and is subject to the effects of wind and sea. However, as you build experience around the ship, you will begin to realize that there are certain advantages to carrier operations. You have more time to make corrections. Your closing rate on the landing area is 30 knots slower. Your actual glide path is shallower. You're operating in a more responsive power range. The arresting gear stops you quickly and surely. A blown tire or loss of brakes is no problem. There is seldom a crosswind and if you do have some kind of problem requiring crash crew assistance, the crew is just a few quick steps away. Concentration is required. A finer attention to all details is necessary. But landing aids have been proved and procedures have been developed to aid you. Be continually aware of the differences in shipboard operations and follow the prescribed procedures. Your safety and the safety of your shipmates depends on your knowing what to do and when to do it. Time, the Mort Company held a major role in fighter development. We'll see the lineage of some of their designs. In 1938, Vought began efforts to produce a fighter plane. The advanced, powerful XF4U project became the outstanding Corsair One. His plane would thrust the company into the forefront of fighter production. Chance Vought F4U Corsair One first flew on May 29, 1940. The Corsair, with its inverted gull wing and powerful Platten Whitney R2800 engine, became one of the outstanding combat aircraft of the war. More than 5,000 Corsairs were produced in 1944 alone. As a replacement for the tough Grumman Hellcat on American aircraft carriers, 
It was the first US fighter capable of exceeding 400 miles per hour. However, it wasn't until 1942 that the folding wind design was finally approved for use on carriers. A combat record in the Pacific shows the true worth of the plane. Only 189 F-4Us were lost in destroying 2,140 Japanese aircraft, a loss ratio of over 11 to 1. In the early 1950s, Vought was still producing the F-4U Corsairs, which were being used heavily in the Korean conflict. Corsairs were used mostly for ground support, but Corsair pilots shot down 12 enemy aircraft, including a MiG-15 jet. The last Corsair, the 12,571st, was delivered in February 1953, and the last operational carrier landing of an F-4U Corsair was made on the USS Valley Forge in 1956. Unfortunately, by this time, new jet engines were making their mark, and the F-4U's load capabilities were beginning to show. Vought's next venture with fighters came with the naval contract issued on December 29, 1944. It was for a straight-wing carrier interceptor, the XF-6U Pirate. By the time the Pirate was ready to go into production, the underpowered straight-wing 1944 design was obsolete and its successor, the XF-7U-1 Cutlass, had been flying for more than a year. Only 30 aircraft were delivered, and these were used mainly for training. After World War II, a great influx of German aeronautical research data was gained by the US. Some work on tailless designs done by the Arado Company offered great promise in high rate of climb and high top speed. The plane first flew in 1948, and the first F-7U-3 debuted in December 1951. The design showed the engineering daring of the time. It was short with no tail, twin rudders and two engines, unlike anything else in service at that time. Looking back with today's vantage point, the airframe reminds us of much more current concepts today. The Cutlass was the first US combat aircraft to be designed from the start to use afterburners. The further redesigned F7U3 with different engines was the first naval aircraft designed for reheated turbojets, and also introduced power controls with artificial feel and an automatic stabilization system. All groundbreaking design events to the vibe. The Cutlass, unfortunately, again suffered from the problem of being underpowered, but this is probably more a reflection of the state of development in jet engines of the day, rather than the design of the airframe. Like many designs of the time, orders were in small numbers with short service lights. Production was cut back in 1954, and it was withdrawn from service in 1957. In May 1953, Vought Division of United Aircraft won the new day fighter contract over seven other competitors. This new fighter, the Exet HU-1 Crusader, was rolled out in February 1955 and flew supersonic on its maiden flight on March 25. The Crusader would be the Navy's first 1,000-mile-an-hour fighter in service. At the time, supersonic flight was a little understood field, and Vought's designers showed their unmistakably clear vision with the results of the new plane. The Vought engineers came up with many brilliant designs to meet the Navy's strict requirements. Toughening an airframe for carrier duty folding the wings and including a tail hook all incurred a weight penalty on any design. Then requiring a supersonic top speed would not use the equate with the low landing speed needs for a carrier-borne aircraft. All of these needs were to combine completely in the FHU Crusader. 
The best example of these you their fangs design would allow for long, unway fuel flights. Is in Brest, France, in the December of 1999. At Vought during production of the Crusader, concepts were being brought up for its successor. In 1956, the Navy again called for submissions on an all-weather interception fighter. The company's entry was the XF HU-3 Crusader III. Vought XFHU-3 Crusader III was on the cutting edge of aeronautic design of the late 1950s. Although the aircraft was designated XFHU-3, it was essentially a completely new design and bore only a superficial resemblance to the earlier FHUs. Initially, five prototypes were ordered. The Crusader III had the same general configuration as that of the earlier Crusader, and kept the variable incidence wing. However, the XFHU-3 was appreciably larger and more powerful. The fuselage was enlarged to accommodate a Pratt & Whitney J-75 turbojet with a thrust almost 60% greater than the previous Crusaders. The lower chin intake was angled forward in order to accommodate its expected greater than Mach 2 performance. Perhaps the most distinctive feature was the use of a pair of large hinged ventral fins to enhance maneuverability, which were extended vertically downward when the aircraft is in flight. These fins were retracted to a horizontal position for landings and takeoffs. On July 25, 1955, the Navy authorized the construction of two XF HU-3 prototypes for its maiden flight on June 2, 1958. During flight testing, the XF HU-3 demonstrated speeds of Mach 2.2 and zoom climb altitude of nearly 90,000 feet. The Crusader III was never flown to its limits because of the windshield assembly, which was made of acrylic and could not take the high temperatures of the aircraft's upper envelope. It was thought that without the windshield limitations, it could have reached speeds as high as Mach 2.7 or 2.9 at 35,000 feet. During the flyouts, though, it was beaten by the inspiring McDonnell F4 Phantom. The Phantom was designed to a more encompassing set of guidelines, which included interception, reconnaissance and ground attack walls. Unfortunately, at that time, the military need was seen to be for two crewmembers and two engines not the stunning interception performance of the Crusader III. The board development contract was cancelled in December of 1958. The limiting windshield was being redesigned when the contract was cancelled. Had it been accepted for production, the XF AGU-3 aircraft would have been the world's fastest jet aircraft in service, with a maximum speed perhaps approaching Mach 3. The aircraft was in every way exceptional, and it's a pity that no place could be found for it. The loss of the order was not only discouraging to the engineers, but a threat to the viability of Vought itself. The next Navy aircraft to be replaced was the lighter tat plane, the Douglas A4D Skyhawk. The new requirements were issued in late 1963, and they were nearly double those of the Skyhawks. To speed delivery and reduce costs, all applications would have to be based on existing aircraft minimizing their risks with current technologies. While the Navy was happy with the speed of their Skyhawks, they also realized that requiring more speed from the new plane would also mean a heavier, costlier plane. So there was no speed stipulation in the contract of the issue. 
What there were though, were requirements in the cost of manufacture, maintenance and operation. On February 11, 1964, Vought won against strong competition the contract to develop the subsonic A7 Corsair II. Developed from the supersonic F8, it was the first supersonic design adopted into a subsonic design. While the lineage from the FHU is unmistakable, the Corsair II was in fact a totally new plane. It retained very few concepts from its Crusader forebears. Even the outstanding variable instance wing was not used in this subsonic attack jet. Best light attack aircraft ever produced. The armaments used on the A7s during their life cover all facets of the US armor. For attacks on surface to air missile sites, Shrike missiles could be used. For structures, 500 pound bombs could be employed. With the ever present danger of the enemy MiGs, sidewinders were always carried. Aside from a little plane's toughness, it was also known for the precise, accurate delivery of all its weapons. In April 1968, the American Marines received their first A-9Ds. These were the first U.S. Army subsonic fighters in 15 years. They were used not only in their attack role, but also in search and rescue missions. During the Vietnam conflict, one of these Corsairs stayed airborne for over nine hours. US Navy was so impressed with the Army's A-7Ds that they ordered further upgrades in weapons sophistication and power plant. These were delivered as the A-7Es. The remarkable accuracy of these planes now became outstanding. The A-70's missions in conflicts eventually totaled more than all of the previous models combined. However, their losses were significantly less. This was attributed to their ability to deliver pinpoint accuracy with their weapons and leave the hostile area. Unfortunately for Vought, very few other nations purchased the Corsairs. Only Greece and Portugal outfitted their air forces in small numbers of these outstanding planes. The Greeks with retrofitted A7Es as A7Hs and Portugal with ex-US Navy A7As. Last of 850A7s were retired from the Navy's inventory following participation in the 1991 Desert Storm combat operations. Grimly, the A7 Corsair series was the last aircraft designed and produced by the company.
During this period, the company had also developed many other weapon systems and helicopters in association with Sikorsky. It should be with pride that they look back on their fighter development years. Very few other companies have produced such excellent aircraft over such a period.